Morning. You made it here for 11 o'clock. Well done. I don't know how many people I've met who said, what, 11 o'clock? I thought you started at 5 o'clock. So this is value for money. Same amount of money, much bigger conference, as you would expect. Um, <clears throat> actually, I think this is going to be a particularly exciting conference. I don't know if you've yet been into the exhibition area. We've got two different small theatres set up and a couple of workshop areas and a whole lot of activity going on there. It's all free for people who are not delegates to the conference. Part of the strategy that we've been developing for trying to ensure that more and more people can access this event or the things um, that are going on round about it. And I'm very keen that we should use these opportunities to try to ensure that as many of the younger people who work in housing associations can get engaged in these debates. Uh, the debates that I'm going to kick off here and that will be picked up not just through the, the kind of main sessions but through the ideas lab that Matthew Taylor from the RSA is uh, kind of hosting and moderating and a whole range of other things um, that we've got planned for this conference. I hope you will enjoy it uh, and I hope that you will give us the feedback that we always need to try to ensure that we just keep getting better and better. <clears throat> I'm a baby boomer. There are a number of us in this audience who are baby boomers. Uh, people who were born in that post-war period where Britain considered itself to be rebuilding, to be creating a new society. It's really quite fascinating, I think, if you look at the old films from, um, well, let's say the 50s. What you see in all of these old kind of pathé news films is a presentation of a Britain that has a sense of optimism, that's looking positively to the future, that thinks it has, as a nation, the capacity to ensure that the future will be better than the past, not just the immediate past of the Second World War, but the past going back through generations. A kind of unshakable belief in the parents of the baby boomer generation that they were building a better society, a better nation, a better world. And not every single bit of that worked out absolutely brilliantly, of course. Some of the new towns were hugely successful. Others have become, I don't know, kind of figures of fun, haven't they, in the way that we talk about the places in our nation. But when I was born in that, uh, not immediate post-war, I'm not that old, but, you know, in the 50s, it's not a big secret. Uh, when I was born, there was a sense that we were building a new Britain. Actually, at that time, we were building 300,000 new homes a year and more. And that kind of unshakable conviction that it was the job of our parents to ensure that the world that we grew up in and inherited was a better world than the one they'd found really did create the environment for the baby boomers to have the impact um, that for good or ill we've had. Actually, I think as a generation, the baby boomers worked very hard at trying to build on that legacy and make the world a better place. Again, some of the things we got right, some of the things we got wrong. But our parents and our governments of the time, their decisions that they were going to build, physically build, a better Britain, meant that when people of my age were moving into the world of work for the first time, and thinking, yeah, we'd like, if we can, to be able to buy a home, it was possible to do so. All the figures that I'm going to use in this presentation are restated in today's numbers. So you have to remember that. I'm not talking about old-fashioned pre-inflation figures. They're all adjusted to today. So, when I was growing up, it was possible when I was grown up, entering the world of work in my early 20s, 
it was possible for me and all of us to consider buying a home if we had incomes of around £20,000 a year. And so we did. And that was the period where owner occupation really, really began to grow because there was a housing market that had sufficient supply in it to allow housing to be affordable. Two and a half times uh, your income was what you would be likely to get for a mortgage and in most cases that was enough. In today's figures, the amount of deposit that you needed was probably around £3,000. Imagine only needing £3,000 today to be able to buy a home, to put down a deposit to buy a home. So our parents created an environment for those of us who were buying our first homes in the late 70s, early 80s, where it was possible for us to do that because they had understood that if the country was to be better in the future than it had been in the past, if it was to be economically successful and socially resilient, they had to invest in building the homes that we needed. And we've screwed up. We took that legacy where basically we were well housed. No one, it, there's never been an occasion in our history where absolutely everyone in the country had the perfect housing offer. But broadly speaking, the combination of social housing and then housing associations, um, a small private rented sector, owner occupation, a market that was more or less in balance and created the environment where it was possible for us to start our family lives with the secure knowledge that we were able to be in control of our own housing decisions and our own housing options. And we've let it all go. I think that's pretty shameful. I've been thinking a lot about this speech, as you can imagine. And I've been just trying to work out, why did that happen? Why was it that that legacy was allowed just to fall away? And some of it was to do with different economic circumstances in the nation. Some of it was to do with the fact that after the Second World War, there were bomb sites. So there was a physical reminder of the nature of the housing problem that we had. But you know, the Second World War bombings destroyed about 250,000 homes. Well, we dealt with that in a year and still carried on building at 300,000 homes a year or more because that was what the nation required. But we moved to different economic times and different ways of thinking about things. And people thought, if you look at the, the um, manifestos of all three political parties through the 50s and 60s, all of them, all of them talk about housing as a key social and public service central to the economic health of the nation and kind of parties falling over themselves to outbid in the number of homes that they would buy. It's unimaginable that you would see that written in party manifestos now. And that's not because we don't have a housing crisis. We do. It's that our thinking about our housing has changed. And one of the key ways in which it's changed is that we think of housing as a private good rather than a public service. And I'm not going to get into, you know, a long detailed kind of debate about whether that's good or bad or whether the politi politics and the policy of it is appropriate. It is just the case that from the point at which it was possible to think of housing as a private good, that was the point at which it became easier for the state, through all different governments of all political colours, to withdraw from investment in this part of what we do. So that was quite an important thing. And the truth is that from 1945 until the mid to late 1970s, I don't make this um, cut-off point exactly the point at which Margaret Thatcher was appointed. I think it predated that. I think it was the previous Labour government and the um, IMF coming to town and all of those things that some of you will remember. But from 1945 till the late 70s, we had a housing policy. From the late 70s until now, we've had tenure policies. So we've argued about renting, owner occupation, how we get owner occupation, whether the right to buy is the right way of achieving it, all of those things, and forgot 
that we needed to have a housing policy. Forgot that right at the centre of all of this, there is an obligation to continue to house our citizens properly. Consequence of that, that £20,000 that it cost my generation to be able to access owner occupation, to have that kind of income in today's prices, it's now 36000 Now, 36000 is quite a lot of money. There are plenty of people in this room who have an income which is higher than that. I know that. But I think that we've got a very distorted view of what household incomes are actually like. It's quite entertaining, isn't it, when you pick up the Mail or the Telegraph and they're talking about the squeezed middle having to get by on, on incomes of 70,000 a year. Uh, 70,000 a year, an income at which if you are trying to buy in London using shared ownership, you can still get state support. Uh, you know, 70,000 is a lot of money. So just so you know, I checked, just so you know, this isn't individual earnings, this is household incomes. 25% of the households in this country have an income of £18,000 a year or less. 25%. The next 25% takes you to an income of 32000 What you need now to be able to buy a home is a household income of 36000 So more than half of the population of the nation is on a household income that is too small for you to be able to consider owner occupation. We have priced half of the nation out of owner occupation. Being a new house buyer is a sport for the wealthy. Not just for people who are individually wealthy themselves, but for people who come from wealthy backgrounds. Because to be able to raise the deposit that you need now, 3,000 pounds in today's money when I was doing it, 30,000 now on average, to be able to raise that, you have to get help. You have to get help from your parents, and that's who it comes from, occasionally grandparents. Two-thirds, two-thirds of all deposits for first-time buyers are now supported by capital input from parents. That has doubled in five years. This is not the way it has always been. That has doubled in five years. So what are the consequences of that for other parts of the market? Well, we have a private rented sector that has become the place that people live in because they're too well off to access social housing. Because honestly, if you're above that 18,000, you're not going to be in the market for social housing. Actually, you're probably going to be a lot lower than the 18,000 to be able to access social housing. So you go to the private rented sector. In the private rented sector now, people are spending 40% of their incomes or more on their rent. I'm being attacked. 40% or more of their income. How on earth are you meant to save money when you're spending 40% of your income on rent? And actually, what are the properties that people are renting? They're the two-bedroom flats and small houses that would be ideal first-time buyer properties had they not been bought by people who are already asset wealthy to rent out as buy to let. I don't criticize the individuals who make that decision, but this is not a strategic approach to resolving our housing crisis. And here's the rub. We because we haven't had housing policies, we've only had tenure policies, we haven't had a strategic approach to resolving, to dealing with our housing challenges, and therefore, as a consequence, as night follows day, we've managed to create an environment where you can't afford to buy, you can't afford to rent, we're not building enough new homes, because the 300,000 homes that were being built for my generation to live in, we're now building 120,000 homes a year. And we have a housing crisis now. Here's another one that I just think is a, and a kind of astonishing fact. Housing benefit is now being paid to people on above median incomes. Why? Because even if you're on above a median income, you're not earning enough to be able to deal with the rent. The single biggest rise in housing benefit over the last few years 
has been in the, the area of people in work earning between 20,000 and 36,000 a year. So above average income, and you're still qualifying for housing benefit, if ever there was a demonstration of a housing market that had failed, of housing policies that had failed, that is it. I hear politicians frequently saying it's absolutely absurd that we're spending 24 billion pounds a year on housing benefit. Listen carefully, it is absolutely absurd that we're spending that amount of money on housing benefit. Why are we doing it? Because for generations, we have failed to understand the housing demands, the housing challenges, and have proper, strategic, fit-for-purpose housing strategies that allow us to get out of the mess. And that is now. All of that stuff that I've just talked about is where we are now. Do not let anyone fool you into believing that we don't have a housing crisis. It's different in different parts of the country. The idea that we have one housing market is also absurd. The idea that you can take one measure, let's call it help to buy, shall we, and make that available in all the different housing markets across the, the country and yet get similar outcomes is barking mad. There are some places where help to buy is absolutely the right thing in that market. Other places where it is utterly irrelevant and some places where a bonfire is well lit and you're chucking petrol on it. Is that sensible housing strategy? No, it's housing by short-term policy initiative. And that is all now. It doesn't deal with the fact that now we've just forgotten about regeneration. We've forgotten about the fact that there are lots of people living in poor quality homes in failing economies. That's the nature of the housing crisis in some parts of the country. We can't ignore that that is part of the housing crisis. That is now. And we're also now continuing not to invest in making our homes energy efficient with all of the fantastic benefits that come from living in energy efficient homes, not least contributing to saving the planet. That's now. Well, here's something that some of you may know, but possibly some of you don't. We've just had a baby boom. Between 2001 and 2012, there were more than 8 million births in this country. That is a baby boom equivalent to mine, the baby boom that I was part of. But when I was born, we were building 300,000 homes a year and making the future better. Now we're building 120,000 homes a year. The 8 million children born between 2001 and 2012, unless we get our act together and do something about this starting now, they will have nowhere to live. This is not hyperbole. This is not empty rhetoric. This is the reality of the world that we have created. Our parents, my generation's parents, created an environment where they knew that if we were to be successful in our lives, we needed to be well housed, and we've created one where we've said we care about our own homes and the rest of you can go hang. We've created an environment where we'd rather hold on to scrubby pieces of land because they happen to be called green belt, even though they're not green, and don't allow any building on it. Which is more important, thinking about these 8 million children born in the last 10 years and their housing futures, or protecting a crap piece of scrubby land and calling it Greenbelt? We cannot allow this to go on. And when I say we cannot allow this to go on, what I mean is we cannot allow this to go on. Because don't we normally just externalize this and say, these politicians, what a mess they've made. Well, okay. Let's just say they did. Just for the sake of argument, let's say it's all been the fault of the politicians. Where does that take you? Should we just leave it to them to fix it? That doesn't sound like a very good strategy, really, does it? This is why the general election campaign is not fundamentally about politicians. They're the target. The general election campaign is fundamentally about us and the people of the nation saying, we've had enough. We have had enough. We're not going to put up with this 
any longer. We are not going to settle for a housing future for our children that looks not just a little bit worse than ours, but a mess. We're not going to put up with a world where half of our children, and this number will grow by the day, will forever be locked out of even considering owner occupation. We are not going to put up with an environment where people move into short-term, private-rented accommodation at astonishingly high rents, paid for by our taxes because of a failure of housing policy and strategy. We are not going to put up with it any longer. And you know, if you talk to people around the country, everyone agrees and they say, yeah, we have got a mess. The housing, it's a mess, it's terrible. But you can't do anything about it. Well, <clears throat> um, there have already been some tweets today about at which point in my speech I would mention the Scottish referendum. <clears throat> Here it comes. If anyone was running a sweepstake. <laughs> One of the things, I'm not going to talk about the outcome, because even though I have a Scottish accent, I have no more idea than anyone else what the outcome's going to be. But what I do know is that what has happened in Scotland over the last six months is that people have said, we think there's been a failure of politics. We think that we have not been served by our elected representatives. We are fed up. We are fed up feeling that no one's listening to us. And amazingly enough, what's happened? They've decided to do something about it. That's what sits behind the debate that's been happening in Scotland. A hugely invigorating debate, whether you think we're better together or that Scotland should be independent, the really striking thing about it is that the quality of political conversation that's taking place there is absolutely fantastic. And it's based on an extended and coherent debate about what kind of nation do we want to craft for the future. When was the last time you felt anyone in English politics doing that. I mean, at the risk of offending someone, and I apologize if I do, but not very much, the response in England has been voting UKIP. The response in Scotland has been saying, we're gonna do something different. I like the response in Scotland, whatever the outcome of the referendum, because what it has done is to demonstrate that you do not just have to accept the status quo. But if we are to challenge the status quo, and this is where this is about us, if we are to challenge the status quo, it has to be the we bit of that sentence. We have to do it. And we do it over a glass of wine or dinner, around meetings in our boardrooms, at this conference, at the CIH conference, at the Northern Housing Consortium conference, we do it. And we wrap a big wall around it and don't let anyone else hear it. We talk to ourselves in excited, creative, invigorating ways and are silent in the outside world. Just think about the last general election. All of us did this, all of, all of us the National Housing Federation, and everyone who's involved in making the case for housing. We did some really smart thinking. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic here. We genuinely did some really smart thinking. And we came up with really detailed plans and really detailed plans that tackled different components of the housing crisis as we saw it then and had lots of good ideas. And different people had different contributions to make and we presented options and we chatted to the politicians, as a result of which housing was silent in the general election campaign. It was not talked about at all. That was bad. Worse was to come. That tactic of being politically smart, as we thought, of trying to ensure that we kept people on side, as we thought, of making sure that we weren't offending anyone in the way that we developed our arguments. 
took us to the 2010 Comprehensive Spending Review, where the single biggest cut anywhere in the entire economy was a two-thirds cut in capital investment in new housing supply. And as you would have noticed, people took to the streets and rioted about it. Or maybe they didn't. Nothing. Nothing. That huge cut in capital investment was accompanied by a monumental silence, not just from the nation at large, but frankly, from us. We cannot afford for that to be the case again. Finally, we've reached the point where people around the country are beginning to understand that we have a housing crisis. People are genuinely concerned about where their kids are going to live. 77%, I think it was, of people, parents that we polled believe that their children's housing future is likely to be less good than theirs. Similar numbers think that government should have a role in doing something about this. 80% of the population believes that government will have nothing to say. Well, we can't allow that just to be, okay, that's the way it is. We have to do something about it. We have to do something that makes sure that if nothing else, we have done absolutely everything we can to protect the interests of those 8 million children born between 2001 and 2012 to ensure that they have a decent home to live in. Under your seats, you will find um, a pack, an election pack. Um, you can pick it up now if you want to and have a look at it. We're working with a, a group of 80 different housing organizations. Uh, yeah, it's good, isn't it? That was quite funny, a little wave of people moving around, scrabbling under their seats. We're working with a group of 80 different housing organizations under uh, what we're calling the Homes for Britain Alliance. We've been using this uh, badge for the last three years at party conferences to try to make housing visible. This year, there will be 80 different fringe events at the three party conferences. And these 80 different events will all have a Homes for Britain banner. And with that group, we've been doing some proper thinking about what is the key message. And you know, you'll read it, you'll see it, you'll hear it. I hope you're going to hear it time after time after time after time after time. And you may at first thought think, that's not a very compelling, sexy message. But here's the message. We want the nation to ask all of those who will be seeking our votes next May to commit to ending the housing crisis within a generation. Took a long time to get into this mess. We have to understand it will take a long time to get out of it. But they have to commit. If they want my vote, they have to commit to ending the housing crisis in a generation and commit to providing a detailed plan as to how they will do that within a year of taking office. Now, it doesn't look like a great call to arms, does it? When everyone marches down Whitehall, if anyone ever does, we want to end the housing crisis in a generation. It's not a great slogan, but it is a great frame for what we need to do. We need our politicians to understand that at root, this is a long-term project which cannot be fixed by short-term initiatives short-term things that you put into the market without thinking about their long-term consequences and then run away until next week. We need to get away from having 41 different programs being managed by the Homes and Communities Agency. That's all about dealing with different things at the margins and trying to make a little bit of difference. None of it is about a strategic long-term plan for ending the housing crisis. And we will be going to ad agencies and creative people to help to get help in framing the messages, in ensuring that we can do and say things that are visible and short and snappy. But we all, everyone here in this room, everyone here who cares about housing, everyone who will read about this on Twitter or look at all of the reports from this event, we need all of us, all of us, to commit to making this demand. We need our politicians to understand 
that there is a bona fide housing crisis now, and they are derelict in their duty to the 8 million children born between 2001 and 2012 if they do not start to think about it now. Now, of course, that's the big message. And we hope that all of these 80 organizations will give it visibility. We hope that you will. In your packs, there are a number of different actions that we want you to take. The first one, this is really important. You've got something that's called a ballot paper. We want you to write on that who in your organization is your general election champion. We need their name and email address and phone number so that we can build a network of contacts all around the country. I, immediately after this, I'm going to be speaking to 80 of the comms professionals from around our movement. We need the contacts so that we've got someone in every organization to talk to. Last night over dinner, um, Lindsay Williams made the cracking suggestion that we should maybe have two such people, one of them 30 or younger. That would be great. I would love it if every single housing association was to give us the name and contact details of one person in your staff who had the ability to do work on your behalf as a key contact about this general election campaign. Because they're the people who are going to have to deal with the failures of our generation. But that's the first thing that you have to do. But there are a whole lot of other activities that we want you to take part in. There are six different milestones during the course of the period from now until the general election. The first of them is the party conferences. We've got that in hand. The other five, there's a whole lot of detail about that in the exhibition tomorrow. Go and have a look at all the different um, information points there. There will be people around um, wearing rather large rosettes like the one Simon is sporting there. If you see such people, you can talk to them about the general election. All these comms people will be getting one. But this is a call to arms, folks. It's not enough just to say, we're doing what we can. We're trying our best in our organizations. This is the point at which we really, really, really have to get out there and make this case. And we have to be disciplined. I'm sure there are some politicians in the room. I know there are some politicians in the room. Here's the thing, if you're a politician, charged with governance, charged with running the country and making decisions. It's great when you get three or four different suggestions coming to you. Not because you think, wow, what a wonderful range of great thinking I've got here in front of me. It's great because you can ignore them all. You can't ignore one single solid question being asked of you over and over and over and over again. We have to be disciplined about asking the question. The Home Truths Report, from which is where some of these figures I've been quoting comes from, which we launched on Monday, that's a national picture. We are providing a similar Home Truths Report for each of the regions of England, which describes the nature of the housing crisis there. And when we say that we're asking our politicians to commit to ending the housing crisis in a generation. We're not specifying which housing crisis. We're saying it's the housing crisis in Middlesbrough, the housing crisis in Manchester, the housing crisis in Camden, the housing crisis in Cornwall. It's, they're different, but they are all problematic and we need this kind of engagement and support and collective activity. So we need you to do the things that are in the pack. Four or five relatively simple things, the, the um, various big ticket items that we will be looking at. Yeah. You will come across in there something called Ho Ho Homes. See if you can guess what time of year we're doing that one at. <laughs> <clears throat> I think it's great. Other people might think it's naff. It doesn't matter. People will notice it. And we've got the housing rally on the 17th of March. And at the moment, I think the only way we're going to be able to cope with the demand for that is running some kind of a raffle. And we, we may be starting quite soon to ask you to think about how you might organize in your own organizations to restrict the numbers of people who want to come. Um, I said to some of my colleagues, I think we should be doing Wembley Stadium. They thought I was nuts. I probably am, but we will definitely fill Westminster Methodist Central Hall and... and if we just fill the hall and talk to ourselves, it will have been a completely pointless exercise. Completely. Might make us feel better, 
but it won't do anything. So we have to use that as a kind of focal point, a rallying point that gets people engaged, that gets people thinking. You all need to be thinking about what are the visible things that you can do. And here's the really important thing for us. It's not just that if we take our heads above the parapet and say what we really think, we have a chance of changing the dynamic, changing the conversation. It is that we, more than anyone else, have the ability to say, and we are absolutely integral to the answers. We can provide answers that are about social housing for people on very low incomes, that are about support and care for people who are vulnerable, that are about different kinds of tenure options where people can move between owner occupation and renting. We should be thinking more, as many people are, about people who rent but buy as they go. There are all kinds of things that we can do. We can do market housing. We can do private renting. This is a nation that needs institutional private renting instead of all those buy-to-letters. We need institutional finance, of which there is a wall, but it needs institutions to invest in. Who's got the capacity, the management knowledge, knows how to do housing management and maintenance, long track record, that'll be housing associations. So we have a big offer to make. The ambition to deliver that came from a conversation with you about what you want the future to look like, said that by 2033, a generation hence, when all those 8 million children will be looking for a home, we could be providing 20% of the housing in the country. One market, one for every two supported houses, subsidised houses of one kind or another. That's a phenomenal offer. That's just the housing offer. We should be core partners of the National Health Service, core partners of local education providers, sometimes providing things directly, sometimes working with them. Our offer is enormous. Our commitment is enormous. The range of things that we can do is enormous. And we can do a lot of it on our own, but we can do much, much more if we're able to get whatever the next government is to support our work. Instead of just always asking the question, why are you not doing more? Wouldn't it be great if the first question they asked was, how can we help you to deliver your ambition? And then we could really get motoring. Now, we will, of course, be providing the parties with our view of how you solve, how you end the housing crisis in a generation. And there are a number of key issues. I'm not going to go into the detail. This will all uh, be worked up further with you and others as we, as we hone our thinking. But there are three big core parts to this. One is about improving the way that we do investment, and we're going to argue in favor of a housing and investment bank, and instead of having 41 different programs, have an investment challenge fund and you know, use some of the financial instruments. There's a lot of potential there. The second, we need to do something different about land. Um, all of the contributions to the reports that Natalie Elphick and Keith House and Michael Lyons are doing talk about land. You can't do any of this without talking about land. And we are developing some ideas about ways in which local uh, planning authorities can identify land for housing and access it more cheaply. And we will argue for more freedom and flexibility for housing associations. You know your neighbourhoods better than people in Elland House, uh, Marsham Street. You know what the rents are most appropriate to charge for different people in different places. You know who you should most have in your homes. All of this is stuff that is the debate of detail that starts from the day after the general election. But we really, really, really have a just phenomenal opportunity in a way that we have not had in at least a generation to make the case for our children to make the case for those 8 million babies born between 2001 and 2012. To make the case that as a nation, we are once again capable of imagining a future for our children that is better than the present that we inhabit. To learn from the thinking and the optimism of our, the, the original baby boomer generation, 
our parents, the optimism and the commitment that they brought to making our world better than the one that they had. Why should we settle for anything less? We have knowledge, expertise, commitment, resource, creativity. We know the nature of the housing crisis better than anyone else in the country because you guys deal with it every single day. We have to make sure that that story is properly heard and properly understood. We have to ensure that any person who wants your vote understands that if we are to be an economically successful and socially resilient nation, we cannot do either of these things unless we end the housing crisis. We will not be able to house our children. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time where we all have to be brave and bold, where we stand up, we allow ourselves to be counted, we make the case. This election has to be our housing moment, and we have to make it so. Thank you very much.